Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. If you have occasion to see Dallas Seminary literature, whether from this year or previous years, and whether you're looking at a catalog or promotional literature or a brochure or a, a sign on the property, you will encounter somewhere along the line the wonderful command that echoes the Apostle Paul, preach the word. Uh, we, we have upheld for all of our existence and still to this day that wonderful command, the value of preaching the word. And this, uh, this week is in many ways a celebration of that, that we consider it important for all that we do to be able to, uh, from this pulpit and from our school, send out people who can preach the word and preach it well. In our estimation, those who preach it well are those who can preach the word that is true to the text and clear for the audience and, and relevant for changing life and interesting to listen to. And the people that you've been listening to this week, we believe, exhibit those kinds of qualities as they preach the word. It has been a good week, and I trust you have been encouraged by it. Uh, Paul Bixler comes to us from today, today comes to us from St. Louis, and uh, where he spent several years as a bivocational pastor, uh, working in the construction field and also pastoring a church. And he's come to Dallas Seminary with his wife of 19 years, Karen, and their two children, Clayton and Madison, and they're with us. I'm going to ask them to stand so that we might acknowledge them. <laughs> Wonderful to have the support and the encouragement of a wife and children for a guy who goes through seminary. I know Paul has expressed to me repeatedly how much he has appreciated his family during this journey. Um, I asked Paul earlier today what he enjoyed most about Dallas Seminary, and he paused for a second and he said, well, it wasn't very enjoyable, but, <laughs> but what I appreciate most is how the Lord has used Dallas Seminary to humble me. And I thought, wow, what a great answer. That uh, it is in the process of learning from our God scriptures that uh, it is a very humbling thing for us, isn't it? So we look forward today to hearing from Paul after seminary. He's going to hopefully stay in the area and continue to work in his business and be plugged in at Stonebriar Church and see how the Lord will guide him into avenues of ministry that he has uh, prepared him for. Would you join me in welcoming Paul Bixler to our pulpit this morning? Thanks. You know, when uh, Dr. Anderson called me, I was, uh, I was pretty nervous that I was going to be one of the senior preachers. And uh, so I was trying to get some encouragement and some prayer support. So I, I talked to a friend and I said, hey, man, you've got to pray for me. This isn't going to be a walk in the park. And he said, yeah, he said, I know. He says, you know, some of those professors that are going to be up on stage with you, they have shoes older than you. <laughs> You know, I thought about that and I thought, thanks for the encouragement, brother. And then I began to really think about it. And I thought, 47-year-old shoes, is that possible? So uh, anyway, whether you're wearing old shoes or new shoes or somewhere in between, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for your investment in my life. You, you allowed me to do something, honestly, that I thought I could never do. And I appreciate that so much. So thank you. Amen. You know, when you love your children, when you really love your children, you desire to be near them. You have this passion to be near them, even when they failed you. It was a couple years back, and my little guy, he, he had done something wrong, and he was sent to his room. And a few minutes afterwards, I was, I was listening at his door, and I could hear him, him crying in there. And guys, it just broke my heart that he was. So I, I slipped the door open and I went into his dark room and I laid down on the bed next to him. And, you know, he was trying to get everything under control. He was doing that whole <laughs> thing. And pretty soon I was doing that whole <laughs> thing. And, and I just realized all the more that when you love your children, you desire to be near them even when they failed you. Throughout the history of mankind, God has had this passion to be imminent among his people. He has had this passion to be near them. From the Garden of Eden to the new earth, we see this pattern throughout Scripture that God has this desire to be near his children. But mankind 
has not always had that desire to be near God. In fact, the story of mankind reminds me a little bit of the story of the little girl from Kansas. You know the story. You remember Dorothy. Dorothy had all that she needed on that Kansas farm. But there was that one thing that was just beyond her reach, just somewhere over the rainbow. So she goes on this journey to find it. You remember. And all along the journey, she sees evidences of where she should in fact be, which is back home. There was the scarecrow and the the tin man and the cowardly, cowardly lion and others until she comes full circle and ends up right back at home again. Mankind had all that he needed in that garden paradise, but there was that one thing, that one thing that was just beyond his reach. So he goes on this journey, this journey of rebellion against God, this journey of separation from God. But all along the journey, he sees evidences of the presence of God to remind him, I think, in part of where he should in fact be until in Revelation 21, he ends up right back where he began in a garden paradise as a physically resurrected person. God has always had a passion to be near man, but mankind has not always had that passion to be near God. How about you? How about you? Can you say that you are cultivating a relationship with the living God, that you are drawing near to him, that you desire to be close to him? If you are like me, although my time here at DTS has been great in that I have learned so much, I have been equipped to to understand the word and to break it down and to preach it and to teach it. But I have unfortunately neglected cultivating that relationship with God. I am not as near to God as I need to be. And if you are like me, here's the scary part. Someday you are going to lead people. As a Christian leader, how can you lead others to be near God when you are distant from him? So the big question today is this. How can we be motivated to draw near to God? And I think the answer is we can be motivated to draw near to God by seeing the pattern throughout history of how he has drawn near to mankind and to us. I want to take you on a journey today, a journey to see God's imminence among his people And it's my desire today that the Holy Spirit would work within your heart to touch you, to inspire faith so that you might change if, in fact, you are not cultivating that relationship with God. Our journey is going to basically uh, take four stops in three different books. We're going to look in Exodus, then we're going to go to John, and then finally in Revelation. So if you will join me, if you'll open your Bibles to Exodus 25, 8, please. Exodus 25, 8 is the first stop on our journey. And what I'm desiring you to see here, I want you to see where God was and where, in fact, he desired to be. Where God was and where he desired to be. And I want to challenge you with this. To draw near to God, for he has drawn near his people in a general presence in the tabernacle. Draw near to God, for he has drawn near his people in a general presence. I mean, general in the sense that All could see it, but not all could access it in a general presence in the tabernacle. That's my challenge for you. Follow along as I read. Exodus 25, 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell in their midst. The context of the passage is Moses is down with the children of Israel and he is being summoned up to the mountain. A cloud or a mist has descended upon the mountain. And and in the mountain, the children of Israel could see the glory of God as a consuming fire. Can you imagine what that would look like? The fire reflecting off every bead or every droplet of water in that mist. And Moses is to go up there. And I can hear the children of Israel saying, can you see him? He's walking up. I can see him. There he is. No, he's just disappeared in the mist. And God is speaking to Moses inside that mist up on the mountain. And in essence, God says this to Moses. I am up here on the mountain, 
but I desire to be with my people. Let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell in their midst. He is desiring to tabernacle among his people. And that's exactly what happens. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, hold it. I know that the tabernacle is not accessible to all, that no one can, anybody can just waltz into the Holy of Holies at any time. They can't do that. And, and it's only the high priest. And you're saying, how is that God really desiring to be near his people? Well, here's the thing. God was near his people in the capacity that he could be near his people. Veiled in a tabernacle. Because when you love your children, you want to be near them. Longman and Dillard said in their introduction to the Old Testament that the primary symbol of God's presence to Israel was that tabernacle. When they saw God, or when they saw that tabernacle, they saw the very presence of God. They knew he was there because when you love your children, you want to be near them. Draw near to God, for he is drawn near his people in a general presence in the tabernacle. I think it was Dr. Ullman that said once, maybe 50 times, that what God has done in the past is a model and promise of what he will do in the future. Only he's too created to do the same thing twice. I want you to check out what God does next to be near his people in regard to creativity. Go to John chapter 1 and verse 14, please. John 1 and verse 14. And what I'm desiring you to see as I read, I want you to identify who the word was. And then I want you to see what in part his coming meant. Who the word was and what in part his coming meant. And I want to challenge you to draw near to God for he has drawn near his people in a physical presence in the incarnation. In a physical presence in the incarnation. Follow along as I read. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The scriptures teach us in John 1.1 1, 1, that the word was God. And then here it says, the word became flesh, and what did he do? He made his dwelling among us. The Greek word is sakanus for that. And it's interesting because it's the exact same word that is used in Exodus 25a where God wants to dwell or to tabernacle among his people. Isn't that interesting? It seems what John is doing is he is drawing his readers back within their mind to where they could remember the glory of God. They know the stories. The glory of God veiled in a tent, but now the glory of God is veiled in human flesh in the second person of the Trinity. The Son of God perfectly human and perfectly divine, not compromising either. It's an amazing thought when you think about it. In fact, J.I. Packer said in his, says in his book, Knowing God, that nothing in fiction is so fantastic as the truth of the incarnation. And I agree with that. It's amazing that God would so desire to be among his people that he would come in human flesh and make his dwelling among us, tabernacle among us. Let me sew in some application here. One of the traits we know about our Lord Jesus Christ is that he was always humbly submissive to the Father. In everything that he did, no doubt in the incarnation, he was humbly submissive to the Father's will. And he came to earth to be born as a man in human flesh. And we know as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says to the Father, not my will but thine be done. A pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ as he was humbly submissive to the Father. And guys, in order for us to draw near to God, we have got to be humbly submissive to the Father. You say, what does that mean practically? Well, let me be vulnerable with you for a moment. I'm a guy who, who struggles at times with coveting. And I was, I was leaving the church parking lot one day, and guys, I could see her coming across the parking lot. She was beautiful. In fact, she was beyond beautiful. She was gorgeous. She was a brand new Toyota four-wheel drive. <laughs> you thought I was going another direction, didn't you? <laughs> but man, I looked at that truck and it had the brush guard on the front. It had the winch. It was raised up, had the big tire. It was a redneck dream. And man, I wanted that truck. <laughs> but what I had to do to be successful is I, I looked at the truck and I said, no, that's not for me in this season. And I humbly submitted myself and I tapped my 1993 Nissan on the dashboard 
And I said, Lord, this is what you've given me for now, and I'm going to be satisfied with it. That could be applied in a thousand different ways with you. What is it that you are struggling with that you are not humbly submissive to God? It could be a relational issue. It could be a matter of integrity. Whatever it is, turn away. Humbly submit yourself to God like Christ did, and you will be drawing near to God. Draw near to God, for he has drawn near his people in a physical presence. Because when you love your children, you desire to be near them. We've seen the tabernacle in the Old Testament. We've seen the coming of Christ and and the glory of God being on earth in physical form. And now I want to take it to more of a present reality with the Holy Spirit. If you'll go to John chapter 14 and verse 16 on our third stop in this journey, John 14 and verse 16. And what I'm desiring you to see as I read the text is I want you to see that this is Jesus preparing his disciples for his departure and what he does to prepare them. And what I want to challenge you with is to draw near to God for he has drawn near to you in an inner presence in the Holy Spirit. Draw near to God for he has drawn near to you in an inner presence in the Holy Spirit. Follow along as I read. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. He does not desire to leave them orphaned. His presence is going to be leaving. So he calls upon the Father to send the third person of the Trinity. You see how the entire triune God now is involved in this passion and this pattern to be near his children. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, comes to live within them. I was reading Tony Evans' book, The Promise, and I was reading about the word helper, uh, which is paraclete. And He says that word is so pregnant with meaning that translators handle it in a variety of different ways. But he says ultimately what it comes down to is one who comes alongside to help. Now I want you to think of that in light of the truth of God's imminence among his people. We have now the Holy Spirit living within us in order to come alongside and help us. That is more than imminence. That is intimacy. God has a passion. Do you see the pattern? To be near his people. And in the church today, he dwells within us in order to come alongside to help us. What an amazing, humbling thought that is. Oh, how that should motivate us to draw near to him. So we've seen the tabernacle and the glory of God there. We've seen the incarnation and the glory of God there. We've seen the Holy Spirit that now dwells within. And I want to take you to a future reality to end our journey And in this future reality, in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, if you'll turn there, Revelation 21, 3, I want you to understand that this is God's final plan. That what God began in the Garden of Eden, he ends in the new earth. That though there were physical people in the Garden of Eden, there are physically resurrected people in the new earth. What he began here, he continues and fulfills in this passage. And what I want to challenge you with is to draw near to God, for he will draw near to you in his perfect presence, in his perfect presence. Please follow along as I read. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Once again, that dwelling place, Sicanus, the same word, to tabernacle among his people. And now God, in his perfect plan, is with his creation, the crown of his creation, once again. He desires to be with them. You see the preposition with and how many times he uses that? 
with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Can you get any nearer than with? God has always had this desire. He has always had this passion to be near his people. If he is gonna be with us devotionally or eternally, why can't we be with him devotionally now? And this is a challenge I'm, I'm giving to you. Since God is going to be with us eternally, let us strive in this life to be with him devotionally. What does that look like practically? Well, let's say you wake up 15 minutes early. It's happened to all of us. We don't know why we're up. So we go to the coffee pot and we get the coffee started and we just happen to see our, our dusty, lonely Bible over there on the, the nightstand. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Get your coffee, go over, pick it up, sit down and begin to read and ask God to reveal what he would have you to know. Give the day to him. Do you, don't you think that would honor him? And then the next night, Set your alarm 15 minutes early and do the whole thing over again. And you're probably saying, hold it. Can I really cultivate a relationship with God 15 minutes a day? Probably not, but you can start there. You've got to have a start. But what if this happened? What if it continued? And it wasn't just something you had to do, but it was something that you wanted to do. And every day you couldn't wait to get to that spot once again. And then the conversation began to carry on throughout the day. And then throughout your life, until you stood before him one day. What a joyful and wonderful thing that would be. Draw near to God, for he will draw near to you in his perfect presence in the new earth. Oh, my fellow DTS students and faculty, this God we serve is infinite and eternal and beyond our imaginations. Our imaginations cannot even capture him. He is so great. He is wholly other than anything in all of creation. And if that God desires to be near you, won't you draw near to him? He has shown that pattern throughout history. Won't you draw near to him? We have seen from the tabernacle to the incarnation, to the Holy Spirit, to the new earth, this pattern of God's imminence among his people. Won't you draw near to him? He loves you and desires to be near you because when you love your children, do you want to be near them? Draw near to God. Thank you. Let me pray. Lord, I come to you now and just humbled with this opportunity that you've given me. And God, I pray that your spirit would work within our hearts today and that we indeed would be changed, that we would change within our action, Lord, and then soon you would give us that passion and desire. Help us to be what you desire us to be. Help us to draw near to you. In Christ's name, amen.